with high crash history. And so we would prioritize uh, pedestrian improvements around these um, parks and schools with high history of crashes. And then also did it in conjunction with automated speed enforcement. So it became a face of speed cameras in Chicago, which I really enjoyed um, um, because it was, it was so awesome to see them work and have a tangible impact on traffic safety. Um, I like to, uh, free time, like to do uh, bike touring and uh, riding my bikes with my kids. And um, I love biking in the winter. It's my favorite, uh, favorite thing to do. So uh, just a little bit to tell you about what's going on in Denver right now. Uh, we're sort of, uh, there was all, a lot of wheels in motion when I came in board, on board in July. Um, but a lot of it is I'm actually just sort of creating the program uh, with the help of some of my coworkers. And so a lot of it's just me being nosy and saying, oh, I heard you uh, say something about Crossbox. Maybe I can help you out there. So um, it's uh, Denver Public Works is um, my department and within the public works is uh, transportation and mobility, and then within transportation and mobility is multimodal programs. So that's where I live, um, and um, I have great coworkers, and uh, they're all very progressive and get it, and so it's a really great environment to do uh, what we do. So what I'm uh, working on right now, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, is uh, sidewalks. You may have heard sidewalks is a big deal uh, in Denver, so figuring out how we're going to build sidewalks, where we're going to build sidewalks, and um, you know what that what that program will look like going forward. Um, also, before I started, uh, the city is uh, uh, in the process of completing uh, the Denver Moves Pedestrian and Trails program. So I'm the project manager for uh, the pedestrian component of that. Um, also, I'm uh, trying to build a crossing improvement uh, program, so identifying areas in the city where we need to do more than just a crosswalk and signs. And then uh, something I also want to uh, establish here in Denver is a citywide uh, multimodal account program, so tracking behavior across the city um, so that we can estimate uh, behavior and changes in behavior and if we were to do infrastructure improvements, how might that increase uh, active uh, transportation. So those are just some of the things I'll be covering a little bit more in detail. So just to uh, start off with sidewalks. So um, the current data we have on sidewalks is a hybrid of different um, databases. Uh, Dr. Cog provided some of the regional information, uh, more specific information about our sidewalks on, on our arterial roadway network. Um, and then also uh, a couple of years ago, our street maintenance team was doing an inventory of everywhere we had curb and gutter. And so while they were doing that, they also noted, oh, well, there's also, they started collecting sidewalk data um, as well. Um, so we have uh, their database. And then uh, with the Denver Moves Session and Trails program, they started doing an aerial review based on 2014 aerial photography of where there are sidewalks. So um, putting those all together constitutes the most up-to-date. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so we are using walk scope. Um, that walk scope, we'll, we're going to use that in the Denver Moves Pedestrian and Trails Plan. And that sort of gives us the quantitative um, information on, you know, because it gives you like, you know, this is a, a good walking route or a bad walking route. So it's helping us like confirm what we're getting from public input, but it's not like it's not contributing to like presence of sidewalks, absence of sidewalks. Um, so and and then they're doing a review of 2014 aerial aerial photography. So there are obviously some limitations. Some new sidewalks have been built since then that we're having to go back and uh, check. But it's important for us to have a database of uh, what's out there so we can know what's not there and then prioritize uh, how to construct new sidewalks. Yeah. Yeah, they they did collect uh, very rough data in some instances. Um, the uh, width of the sidewalk, not condition, uh, that is a, a big sticking point now. And you know, uh, with, uh, with the mayor's office and old legal, uh, we uh, there's some thoughts of not wanting to know the condition because if we know the condition, then we're liable for the condition. Um, 
so I'm glad I'm, I'm not wrestling with that. Uh, uh, and, and also, we had uh, one of our interns uh, who was really good with GIS was able to write a script that now also helps us identify the width of the buffer where we have detached sidewalks, so not right on the streetway. So now we actually can approximate the width of the buffer if the buffer is um, is there. So. Um, that's really great. So we we have now have a, a pretty good, I'd say, 95% complete database of all the sidewalks in the city, and then all, also all of the gaps. Um, so what we are going to do with this data is um, prioritize the gaps based on some criteria uh, for new construction. And the the model that we're using in 2017 was based on uh, Seattle's sidewalk prioritization um, model. And um, it'll probably mod be modified after our Peds and Trails plan is complete because uh, it, we are getting some interesting feedback in terms of uh, what sort of land uses are most desirable for people to walk to. That was one of the outreach, things, uh, outreach questions we did. You know, what are the places you want to be able to walk and bike safely to? And some of the feedback we got was you know, interesting. Uh, grocery stores ranked really high. Um, which, I mean, which makes sense, but when you think of like a big grocery store trip, lots of people often think about like, well, I just want to, I'll load everything in the car, but walking to the grocery store is maybe more of a more like European model, you know, like frequent, you know, short, uh, more frequent uh, trips and, and so forth. So we'll use the feedback we got from the Peds and Trails outreach um, uh, actions to inform how we prioritize. But um, just to kind of go over what we're doing for 2017. So. The first level is we looked at is the gap, what kind of roadway is the gap adjacent to? And this is also can be seen sort of as a proxy for safety because we know that arterials um, have higher speeds and the faster a car is going, the more likely if they hit somebody, the more likely it will be a, a, fa a fatal or serious injury accident. So we want to prioritize uh, gaps on arterial sidewalks um, over a connect connector in residential streets. And then uh, we also uh, wanted to estimate um, and prioritize gaps that serve um, major uh, places that, are, that usually encourage or facilitate walking, like you know, transit and rail, employment centers, um, and various uh, you know, parks, libraries, things like that. And then we also, the third layer is um, we wanted to identify using census data, um, identify parts of the city uh, that would likely have higher levels of walking. And so using uh, 2010 census tract data, we identified uh, you know, high areas of low car ownership, um, you know, disabled populations, high senior, low youth, or high youth, and then low income housing. So um, all, and, you know, all, all of this will likely be refined. 2017 is sort of our, our first stab at it. And, um, and, and Peds and Trails will, will come up with the, the 2.0 prioritization. But this is what we're going with right now. So just to kind of give you a look at what our gaps look like, we have uh, over 350 miles of sidewalk gaps in the city of Denver. And uh, this kind of shows the heat scoring with you know, you know, red being you know, kind of hitting all the points of our prioritization and then green being lower. So the, the good news, if there is good news to be had in this, is that the majority of segments were on lower scoring, which, uh, which is good for us because it means we can address the higher scoring ones first and, and uh, you know, where that, are, that serve a, a greater use for people who walk. Um, so in, let's see what I have next. Um, so for also the other caveat to 2017 is in order to expedite construction, uh, it was determined uh, by um, city staff at, that um, we would construct sidewalk gaps on city property. So we looked at all city-owned property, DPS property, parks, uh, parks property, and um, that just so that you know winnows the 357 miles down to 45 miles and 291 segments. So that's the, this is sort of what we're looking at just for 2017. My hope is that 2018 we'll, we will come up with a way to address, you know, how do we construct sidewalk on a very high priority place that it happens to be on, you know, a residential street or, uh, you know, like a, a business owner or, you know, a tra up connecting to a transit. So um, that's what we're going to wrestle with in the, the pedestrian plan. Um, what we are looking at now is we 
have uh, people going out in the field and looking at the sidewalk apps, and there's lots of things to consider when looking at constructing a sidewalk. It, it can't just, I mean, it's not just a, you know, a blank swath of land. There's these you know, utility poles, or sometimes it can be an issue of a wetland or uh, uh, you know, manholes, all sorts of things that we have to consider that in, influence whether it's easy to construct or not. Um, but our, our hope is that, um, you know, after, like, con after completing this field work, we will be able to uh, construct um, sidewalks in a place that are actually going to serve people and where people will use them. Um, it would be really easy to construct a bunch of side sidewalk up in the northeast part of Denver where there's a bunch of vacant land, which you can see some, um, but it's not really a, uh, a great use of the funds. So we have $2.5 million for 2017 for construction. And uh, this is just the same map if you take away arterial. And, um, constructing sidewalk on residential and collector streets tend to be a little bit easier. Um, and that it, it just takes, it knocks off about eight miles of arterial roadway. But, so this is just sort of the analysis that's going on right now. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Denver Moves Pedestrian Trails Plan. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have heard of the Denver Right Plan? Denver Right Plan Company. Two people. My, we have more. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Denver Right is a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's it's a, the synthesis of four um, planning processes at one time. So the Denver Moves Pedestrian and Trails Plan is one of them, and then there's also uh, Denver Moves uh, Transit. There's uh, the Gain, Gain Plan, which is looking at Denver Park, and then there's also Blueprint Denver, uh, which is sort of looking at the big picture growth of Denver in the next 30, 40 years. What do we want Denver to look like? So we're looping some of our planning processes under the umbrella of Denver Right. And um, we are doing, um, we had in October, we did five outreach events where we went to different parts of the city, getting people's feedback. The thought is, you know, since we have doing, we're doing four plans simultaneously to try to curb uh, outreach fatigue and being bombarded with email, you know, listservs and things like that, that we could uh, sort of have an economies of scale here and you know, get people like, oh, I'm actually interested in parks, but since I'm here, maybe I can. You know, learn what's going on with uh, pedestrian trails and vice versa. So, um, so that, that's what's going on right now. And I'm glad to hear that uh, that, that there, we have still have some work to do. And it would be great uh, if I could get uh, things in with you guys uh, going forward. So you guys can distribute information because a lot of the things that we're talking about in the Denver Right planning process uh, apply to the health and wellness of uh, people in Denver. So. Um, my plan specifically is the pedestrian and trails plan, and you know we're looking at. Um, we have a, a co. I'm a co-project manager with a, a representative from Parks, and he's looking at the regional trails network and improving connectivity to those trails, and then looking for opportunities where new trails could be built. And then I'm specifically looking over the pedestrian environment. You know, with my my priorities being um, how where people are walking and providing good, comfortable, enjoyable, safe places to walk. And then also when we get to crossings, how to safely cross streets. So we are doing a lot of different. Um, we're we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible in our outreach with the Denver Denver Right. There's individual presentations like this, like what I'm doing right now. We also have something called the Think Tank, and the Think Tank is a 55 member uh, group of people taken from all different parts of the city. Uh, in various different professions, and they are sort of focusing on big picture. You know, what is, what is uh, you know, how can we influence Denver? You know, they're supposed to be sort of representative demographically of the different people in Denver, and you know, providing uh, big picture guidance to the planning process. Then each individual plan has a task force, and these are technical experts. Uh, so on the, the Peasant Trails Task Force, we have a couple of city council members. We have uh, people from the Transit Alliance and RTD and all, all uh, different kinds of people who can sort of look at the fine grain analysis of you know, the major milestones along the planning process. Like when we come up with a report, we'd like their input. And there are also our liaisons back into the community, so we rely on them to reach out. Um, 
It appears that we need someone from health, mm -hmm. public health, on our task force. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so that's good. But it'd be good to have someone on the Pep and Trail Task Force. So. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also, you know, presenting to boards and commissions. Uh, we're, we we utilize the um, there's the mayor's bicycle advisory committee and the mayor's pedestrian advisory committee. So we're presenting to them and also relying on them to get back into um, the community. And the idea is so that we try to get uh, a complete picture or as complete as possible of uh, the public's input and thoughts on uh, what they want Denver the Denver uh, pedestrian and trail network and environment to look like. So um, to just sort of, uh, to briefly talk about what we are going to do in our accomplishing the Peds and Trails program. The first is to identify, you know, what are the problems, what do we need to improve, and then uh, based based on the feedback we hear, phase two is, you know, okay, this is what we heard, did we get it right? What do you think? Uh, um, what do you think about what we suggested, and how should we prioritize these plans? And then. Um, Phase three is the really crucial one is that it will kind of lay out the plan for, you know, this is what we you we heard from you, this is what we're proposing, and now this is how we're going to accomplish it. And uh, I'm really, really excited for this. Um, so, uh, like the Denver, there, there will be three different plans underneath the Denver Moves brand. There's the Denver Moves Bikes, Denver Moves Transit and Denver Moves Session and Trails. And Denver Moves Bikes was uh, completed several years ago. And uh, my colleagues who work on that program, it's, it's wonderful. They have like, all their projects laid out, and now they spend their time just executing the project. And I hope that um, uh, Denver Moves Pets and Trails gives me a similar plan, and that uh, you know we have the project, and then we just go about executing them as efficiently, as timely as possible. Yeah? Uh, could you um, give a suggestion to the bike people that going from here Marzello uh -huh. on your bike. Um, it's really hard to really get over I 70 and then Peoria. Sure. It's a very dangerous piece, yeah. I think, just to get up to. Sure. So, just to let them know that that's a very high priority to get up to. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely I do that. Struggle getting up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, there's no like, do you use like uh, on street yeah. roads? Uh, yeah, like, uh, there's just like no bike lanes. And, uh, yeah. It's very difficult uh, going over the railroad tracks. Sure, sure. Just do it. I will, I will absolutely do that. Yeah. It seems like that inner inner fire to Chicago is probably next to what you're talking about. Sure. Uh, also, you know, like, you know, the fire and the fire and the fire and the Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not the connection. We like. Yeah. We'll have like policy recommendations on you know what we should do because we you know once we get sidewalk built that's great but then how are we going to maintain it? I mean, the, the biggest question that I have is in that model that you shared. Uh huh. Um, like, if you had the five points for low income, the five points for elderly. Sure. Classes, sure. But has there been more thought about <laughs> how how are you focusing on? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, we try to get hit targets, uh, and you know, like I said, this is you know just the first um, first stab at it. So we do try to address issues of equity by considering areas with low income housing and low car ownership. Um, but then also we want to consider geographic equity, and so that's another thing um, that we are coming up with. Um, basically, like dividing the city up into different regions and um, making sure that you know after we consider um, other factors for our prioritization, that we're distributing the the resources around the city uh, equally as possible. So it's definitely something that we're concerned about, and we'll we'll try to address as best as possible. So uh, just uh, two final things closing out um, the Pets and Trails. So we had uh, done um, a, a very modest uh, social media campaign where we had asked people to 
comment on you know where they like the bike or you know things that they're interested in and so use the ha using the hashtag Pedestrian Trail. So you could see that on Instagram and Twitter if you want. And something we also developed that will be closing uh, shortly is just a, a very brief um, online survey. And the idea was that this would sort of support some of the other efforts we had done, specifically targeting um, uh, demographics that we may not have hit with our larger uh, outreach efforts. And so this is a survey that if you are, if you would like to uh, distribute through like Facebook or Twitter or whatever, um, it's just a very basic survey that has people talk about, you know, problem areas and, uh, you know, things they'd like to generally improve. So we've done um, a lot of uh, online stuff and it's, it's very uh, time efficient. So this is, this is something we did. Um, so when we did the outreach efforts in our, our big five big events, we had a big uh, floor map that was probably the size of this area right here. And we had like a sticker exercise and we had people put stickers on parts of the city that, that needed improvements or places they liked. And then, um, you know, we had a couple other exercises where we asked people, you know, with, uh, we gave them five uh, monopoly dollars to distribute how they, we should prioritize, you know, like equity or safety or connectivity, different types of values. And then we also had an exercise uh, with, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier about, you know, what are the land uses? You only got to choose three and there's like a list of 20 different land uses. What are the most important land uses for you to be able to walk and bike to safely? And then we also, everything that we did in person, we had it um, mimicked on this uh, website, on the website Matchinair. Have any of you guys used Matchinair before? It's a really great uh, online survey tool and it allows you to use uh, like maps integrated with the, the survey questions. You just, so something we used and it's been really great because then you can, uh, you know, really drill down people's responses by, you know, where people are commenting. And um, anyway, so this is just, this is sort of just a screen grab of what we asked uh, people to comment on through the, the online survey. So uh, transitioning into uh, crossing, this is just a very uh, important thing that I ask you all to memorize as you <laughs> um, no. So what this is, is, this is basically our crossing decision flow chart. And um, so when we, and uh, sort of to back up a little bit, um, right now we don't have a formalized uh, consistent way for addressing crosswalks in, um, in sort of a, like a global perspective. Uh, basically, the way we address it now is either we get a complaint from a citizen or a city council person uh, contacts us or an area engineer is doing uh, field work and they say, hey, there's a problem here. And so it, we're being, we're very reactive with the way we look at uh, crossings for people. We, uh, and I'll get to that in a bit where I, we want to be more uh, proactive and sort of uh, you know, waiting and sort of waiting for a problem or a complaint. Um, so, but what, what this flowchart helps us do is help us decide where we should where we should install crossing. So, the, the, the bare minimums for us to do a crossing are it needs to be at least 300 feet away from a stop sign or a signal. If it's closer than that, um, it's bad for vehicle compliance and uh, sh a short enough distance that someone can use the stop stop sign or signal. Um, and then beyond that, uh, once it's 300 feet, then it needs to have meet a minimum demand of uh, at least 20 people an hour, and that can be uh, any day, any time in a 24-hour uh, period. Uh, but at least 20 people need to be crossing at that uh, location, and it's all it's weighted higher for sensitive uh, uses, uses of the road, like uh, people, uh, young children, and seniors. And uh, if it meets that demand, uh, that demand, then we look at the actual roadway, and we how many cars are using the roadway and how fast they are going. And based on those criteria, it determines, well, we, here we can do uh, just a, uh, maybe just a crosswalk with signs, or we might do a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, which are like the flasher beacons that you uh, actuate. Or if it's on an arterial, we could do a hawk, which is an actual pedestrian signal that functions as a traffic signal that is actuated by uh, pedestrians. And, um, it forces people to stop on a, our on arterial. So, this, based on all those sorts of things, um, we are you know prescribing different different improvements. Um, so, uh, what what I would like to going sort of into the proactive, what we're I'm working on now is uh, 
trying to basically account for every intersection in the city and uh, using a, a prioritization model that has yet to be de uh, determined. Um, I, I look at every intersection in the city, and if it's uh, signalized, you know, it'll go into one criteria, and if it's unsignalized, it'll go to another. Um, so that basically we can approximate where problem areas are in the city using crash data or census data, and um, and then we can basically make a program that it would be an annual program where we just knock off the, the highest priority locations uh, every year until we're done. And um, that would uh, make uh, make it better than what we have right now, which is we're just relying on the information we get. And uh, sometimes it's just the squeaky wheels that are getting the grease, and we'd like to grease the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Is there any way to measure the traffic? Can you just like, so I'm thinking about um, crossing Hollywood Boulevard and Hollywood Boulevard, and then there's like this big road that goes across. Yeah, I know, I know. So that is that is difficult because um, with the what with the way our model is now, it, it it acknowledges where there's an existing demand, and it's really hard to um, approximate it where it doesn't exist. But what I'm hoping is that, and and that's with our reactive model. What I'm hoping with a more proactive model, we can maybe just use existing demand as not necessarily as a qualifying criteria, but as like a consideration. So if two locations, all things being equal, maybe we do the one where people are already walking, but it wouldn't eliminate the possibility of doing a crosswalk. Because we know that when you build infrastructure, a pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, people use it. And um, before before you built it, where were those people? You know, they were just, they were on another road. So that's my hope that we can transition and a better address the lack of uh, existing demand. Uh, so uh, the last thing I uh, am working on setting up in is uh, setting up is a uh, bicycle and pedestrian count program. This is actually a map of the of Minneapolis, and um, from what I've gathered, uh, Minneapolis actually has the most robust citywide count program. Uh, a lot of cities and counties will do individual counts and one off. Um, but it's maybe project specific, like they're just doing a before and after, or they don't really cover the whole city. So um, Minneapolis serves as a really good example for us um, in terms of uh, what what is uh, what is possible. The one caveat being um, Minneapolis does all of their counts uh, manually, so they get volunteers to do it, which I've been involved in. And it's just, um, Training and arming volunteers. Uh, I, and I did this for a very small city in, in Culver City, and that was hurting. Hurting cats is putting it uh, very delicately and diplomatically. It's really difficult. What I would like to do is actually have um, City of Denver's uh, program be completely automated. We would use uh, technology that just counts for us, so that we don't have to train people and get their sheets and uh, decipher people's handwriting. And uh, be more efficient. Yo, no. Yeah. So you can confirm. Uh, you've heard it. A, a second witness here. Um, and uh, our our program would be would use use three different kinds of counts. We would use we would have permanent count locations so that we can look at uh, a, you know annual trends. And um, and what's good about permanent locations is that you pick them for their representative quality. So you don't just pick permanent locations. Uh, like on the Shade Creek Trail, and say, well, this is how it is everywhere. Uh, you try and pick a, a handful of locations that have different qualities to them, so that when you want to approximate, um, you know, what activity could be in a different part of the city, you have something uh, realistic to base it on. And then we would do annual locations, and so these we would maybe do these once or twice a year, and you know, in the spring and the fall. And then uh, you know just sort of see as a gauge, you know, like where, you know, how are people moving in and around these areas? And um, this gives us an idea of like a, a citywide how people are moving and where people are moving. Again, using um, uh, trying to balance where they're located on arterial collectors residential. Are they by a school? Are they not? Sort of looking at the complete picture of the environment, so that again we can uh, use this information to help us explain where we don't have information. But then also pro project specific counts. So if we want to know specifically, you know, when we install this bike lane or we build a sidewalk, you know, what is the impact 
that we had and then make it measurable. Um, what's uh, great about having this uh, data is that it allows us to do so many different things. You know, we can see changes in behavior, uh, helps us now analyze the impact of new infrastructure, um, you know, conducting risk, risk and exposure analysis. You know, like we have so many pedestrians walking here and we know that crashes, you know, there are four pedestrian crashes here and, you know, how do we know if a, one pedestrian crash is a, uh, I mean, always it's a big deal, but how do we know it's a big deal compared to, you know, what if there are 10,000 people walking there a day and there's only one crash versus there's two people walking a day and there's a crash. We know that there's, um, you know, we can get really valuable information from this, from this data. And um, also, this is something that the city's working on right now is the Vision Zero plan and, you know, the idea of being um, zero uh, traffic-related fatalities. And um, this will help us uh, know how we're doing and uh, where we need to do better. So that is the uh, sum of my presentation. And uh, if you guys have any questions, happy to field them. But thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so, oh, okay. No, thank you, Representative. Oh, okay. So we did some work. Okay. Um, we, did, we have a program, which is a electronic health record data that pulls information from the record to be able to look at community computer phone records for various health, health issues. Uh -huh. One is the uh, uh, we measure BMI. Okay. And we o we have overlaid neighborhoods to actually see where there is South Asian people age group, <coughs> which is fascinating to look at some of the work you're doing and overlay that yeah. to be able to see. And then looking at changes over time to yeah. see if the, because these are electronic health centers, people who are going to survive uh -huh. And they're both, and we see disparities of IQ in that, so that we can come up with some of that equity issue. Uh -huh. And the idea is to open up access to those communities to have better walkability, biking, and those types of things, so that we can then address those, not just in the provider's office, but also in the community. Is, is, um, how is that um, data? Uh, like categorized like geographically like is it to like the zip code or census tract. the census tract yeah well, that would be a really great I would be really interested in having that we could build, build that into our model and prioritize the census tracts with high higher percentage of BMI that would it could be actually awesome. be used for use of the prioritized areas yeah yeah absolutely I would be yeah. totally who would like to be involved there we go So that's one thing, but another thing that comes to mind for me is we have a physical activity subscription oh. project that we work on five years ago <laughs> that um, just fits the interest. So we're looking um, or proposing for a future address group, spot for address, and we're instead of saying we need to get more exercise, we say we need to get more exercise and kids do different activities.
walking with horses are very important factor in yeah. and so the time of Lincoln and the community of Lincoln which is um, that's why it's very important to teach all children to help to get people active in the community and uh -huh. talking about the ballot. So, so it, it's really <laughs> like auto generate a route for services that they could access by walking or biking or no those are two different oh. concepts. Uh, maybe in the future they will do it. I think there could be some nice uh collaboration between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Like the uh, like where pedestrians have can go in any direction, like that. Is that no, 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 like that's a process. Oh, like the light lines or the solid road. Yeah. yeah, so the solid red, we call those decorative crosswalks, and um, we're <laughs> we're careful. To, uh, some people, not from public works, call them a safety enhancement and. There's actually not data to support that they're a safety enhancement. I do think they have value with respect to place making and community uh, community building. Um, they can be very uh, nice to look at and good for creating a sense of uh, space, which may encourage more people to walk with that. You know, we know that when more people walk, uh, safety in numbers. So there's maybe some tangential benefits, but to them of themselves, like there's there's not engineering data that supports their their use as a safety Im impact, but they're more of a place making instead. I think it's one thing sort of more related to evaluation. Public health and the health side of things, we all come to health and public health. Is that something that people in public works and city can do to see whether or not a particular intervention actually is uh, effective and what it turns out to be what it yeah, I mean, there's a big evaluation component of, uh, you know, we do like before and after uh, volume analysis, that uh, we do before and after crash analysis as well. So, you know, that is definitely something we consider. But, yeah. Yeah. So, I guess this is from um, a So yeah, so uh, two-part question. So in our plan, in the scope of what we are going to deliver, there's an education and outreach component of that. So uh, that's going to be probably in the spring of this year, and we have we haven't quite developed it yet. But um, we we do want to address that side, you know, like uh, um, educating motorists and uh, drivers. Um, with respect to rights, um, another component of what we are doing is, um, is a policy benchmarking exercise. And uh, we're looking at every city policy, informal, formal uh, city code that impacts the pedestrian. And um, we are sort of doing an analysis of uh, you know, how are we doing compared to uh, other cities? Are we on par? Are we below? Or, you know, you know could we be better? And or are we exceeding in some cases? So uh, we will be coming up with policy recommendations to actually change policy in the city that you know will give uh, you know pedestrians um, more rights if that's the case, or uh, give uh, pedestrians a preference in you know in certain spots. So I, I hope that we will address those issues um, that way. And I know that I mean there's a, aside from the, the work that uh, we're doing. Also, um, the nonprofit organization Walk Denver is, does a, a very um, excellent job at advocating for pedestrian rights and uh, and energy use in the city. So. Yeah. Similarly, something that comes to mind Yeah, and so um, and it was just I think as somebody that walks it actually yeah. I was like oh yeah I should I feel like I do look around my scope. 
yeah. you know, I don't make eye contact with yeah. either. Yeah. And so is there more of that of th those kinds of exists in terms of plans? Yeah, I'm not you know, I'm not sure what we are gonna come up with yet, uh, with our education. I mean I, I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, I do want to uh, have a balanced approach and not and I think what some uh, organizations do is um, you know kind of almost like victim blaming and putting too much onus on the pedestrian. Um, I think really successful cities put almost all of the responsibility on the driver and uh, that's my bias but I think um, drivers should carry the, the majority of the responsibility so but we will try to do a balanced campaign um, educating everyone about that but I don't want it just to be like stop texting and look up and make sure you don't get into it. I'll give it a little more teeth. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's lot there's lots of different technology. There's um, passive and active uh, infrared. There's video. There's uh, pneumatic tube. And uh, my my idea is that we'll basically just have a, a suite of technology technology options that we'll use on a site specific basis for the best you know the, whatever the best um, you know technology is for that site. We'll use that there. And is that is that happening or is that happening? No, it's happening. Yeah, not. I mean, it's not happening in Denver, but it will. No, no. Yeah. But so yeah, that's what's happening in Denver. Oh, um. It sounds like. Yeah. So we do have. We, yeah, we do have. We do have. Some, it's been very. Um, there's not right now. We do have automated counts, but they're mostly project specific. Or um, you know, parks department has several permanent counters on the trails, and I know they're great, um, but they're very, very limited in what they can actually offer you with respect to analysis. Oh, that's really big thing. Oh, wow, you know, on the Cherry Creek Trail, there were, you know, 4,000 people today, you know, so that doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in another trail where there are no, you know, so. Yeah. Um, I think it's primarily right to use that this is now as an institution. It seems like there, there are organizations that also benefit from uh, more precise counts of what's going on. But that has reconsidered finding partners. Um, I think it's possible. I mean, like I'm building this program from nothing, so uh, so <laughs> I think any advice you have would be uh, more than welcome. Yeah, and I think there that's a, a good council. Uh, there's probably a lot of people that uh, that get interested in the data we collect and might be willing to throw some coins in the hat. There are a lot of people across the that have their hats. No, I do. I don't know. Kayla Gilbert. Yeah, environmental. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be down to her. <laughs> Give me your checkbook. Yeah. Um, so maybe they want to come in. I think this is a good probably a time to do that. Bring in this uh, um, crosswalk in the yeah. cloud. Yeah. And so is that um, is there any policy work or cost department of an organization that they need to work on that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I mean we're definitely gonna have to address that in our in the plan. Right now, it's just sort of well, whatever happens, happens. And um, you know, it's just this morning on my ride in, I saw a guy in a walker walking up 14th at Spear in the road. Uh, you know, and uh, I, you know, like you have to do a better job. You know, there's definitely there's, there's definitely a better way to do to accommodate sensitive users of the road more than people who are not every day. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I'll always leave some of my cards here if uh, you sit. No pressure.